Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's public program, Henry David Thoreau, Thinking Disobediently, with Lawrence Buell and Megan Marshall. We're here in Worcester in Antiquarian Hall with a robust, robust audience watching us on YouTube as well. We are on the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain a vibrant presence here in central Massachusetts. My name is Scott Casper. I'm the president of the American Antiquarian Society. It's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Because we have several newcomers here this evening, I'd like to tell you a little bit about AAS. Uh, we are a national research library located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in the primary source materials we have been collecting since 1812 printed and manuscript sources, as well as graphic materials. The society fosters a broad community of inquiry through its research programs, its fellowship programs, and public programs like this one tonight. And we welcome people to use our collections. Whether you are here in Worcester or somewhere else, you can use our digitized collections that we have through our website. If you're here in Worcester or nearby, we welcome you to come and use our collections right here in the reading room. This program is being live streamed, as you know. We're also uh, recording it, and it will be available after tonight on our YouTube channel. So you can tell your friends about it, or you can watch it again if you like. We thank you for joining us this evening. As a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support you can provide to help us keep offering programs like this one. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome two eminent scholars and elected members of the American Antiquarian Society for a conversation about a brand new book. Lawrence Buell is the Powell M. Cabot Professor of American Literature Emeritus at Harvard University. He has been thinking about Henry David Thoreau across his distinguished career in books including Literary Transcendentalism, New England Literary Culture, The Environmental Imagination, Thoreau, Nature Writing, and the Formation of American Culture, Writing for an Endangered World, Literature, Culture, and the Environment in the United States and Beyond, which won the John G. Coelty Prize for the best book in American culture studies, Emerson, the winner of the Warren Brooks Award, and the future of environmental criticism. In 2007, Larry Buell won the J. Hubble Medal for Lifetime Achievement in American Literary Studies from the Modern Language Association. His new book and the subject of tonight's program is Henry David Thoreau, thinking disobediently. Megan Marshall shares Larry Buell's immersion in 19th century New England literary culture. She's the author of two award-winning biographies, The Peabody Sisters, which received the Frank Francis Parkman Prize and the Mark Linton History Prize, among other awards, and Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, winner of the Pulitzer Prize in Biography in 2014. Both of her books won the Massachusetts Book Award in nonfiction. She teaches in the MFA Creative Writing Program at Emerson College, where she is the first Charles Wesley Emerson College professor. She was also president of the Society of American Historians in 2020-2021. Now, I could go on at greater length about Larry and Megan's accomplishments, but we'd really all rather hear from them. So here's how it'll work. First, Larry Buell will talk for about 15 to 20 minutes about the book. Then Megan will engage him in conversation for a bit about the book. And then finally, we will open the floor to questions from you in the audience here in the hall and also questions from our audience on YouTube. So now it is my pleasure to welcome Larry Buell to the stage. Thank you, Scott, for those generous words. Uh, thank you, uh, all who are here, for uh, sharing this hour with the two of us and uh, to our virtual audience who are tuning in. Um, so that's the book, the cover, that is. Um, it's the shortest book I've ever written by far, uh, but none have given me more pleasure than that. Uh, perhaps there's a lesson here 
I should be belatedly uh, absorbing uh, my advanced age. It was my COVID project, uh, you could say that, uh, started uh, as a happy convergence of um, personal interest and uh, publisher uh, inveiglement. Uh, so what are its uh, claims to interest broadly? It's the first short but comprehensive account of Thoreau's thought, life, work, and significance in many decades, surprisingly. Um, it's intended for a broad readership, not just specialists, but them too. Hopefully insights on both sides uh, in that sweet spot uh, between pedantry and um, watered down popularity. Um, it's up to date. It's the first book to absorb the uh, explosion of new findings about Thoreau uh, that's come out in the last decade about his life, the political Thoreau, Thoreau the man of science, Thoreau the writer, uh, Thoreau the thinker. Um, a couple of which uh, are in the chat for the virtual audience. Um, Laura Walls's uh, biography, Thoreau, A Life, magisterial biography. Uh, Bob Gross's um, The Transcendentalists and Their World, uh, A New History of Concord uh, in the Lifetime of Thoreau in that group. Um, Seven chapters, that's the table of contents. Three anchor chapters up front, uh, then four on more specific dimensions. That's it in a nutshell, 115 pages. I love it. Um, <laughs> one special uh, fascination for Thoreau as a subject for me and I hope for others too. Well, I know for others too. Uh, it's been true over time, is the disparity and yet the conjuncture. What to make of the connection between the person and the mythical Thoreau that's been built up uh, from many sides. Thoreau himself, um, the best image that we think we have Interesting, look at the tousled hair. Uh, most uh, 19th century photographs, daguerreotypes, uh, people were neat. Their hair was combed. Henry, no. Um, that's the uh, statue of Thoreau in front of the cabin replica that stands at the Walden Pond State Reservation. What's he doing? Um, often, People wonder, uh, he's beholding. Is he extending an invitation? Maybe not. Maybe he's more lost in thought or observation. But in any case, um, that's one of many images that uh, mythicize the man. Um, and for me, um, the fact that Thoreau is one of the tiny number of American creative writers uh, who has in time achieved something like folk hero status uh, is definitely part of the draw, part of the attraction of studying him. Uh, Thoreau's, one, as I say in my book, Thoreau's one night in jail and two years of bivouacking in the woods near his home have taken on a mystique more durable than Lord Byron's philandering Alexander Pushkin's duel or Hemingway's hunting exploits. Uh, the Russians might disagree about Pushkin, but we're not, we don't care about them these days, so that's okay. So what else I have to say now, um, I'll briefly run down the simple timeline of the outward events of his life. Um, the uh, long shadow that that has cast over time uh, and some of the challenges of understanding uh, this 
person and his writing uh, that follow from that. So a sketch of Thoreau's life. Born 1817, Concord, Massachusetts. A small town then, uh, fewer than 2,000, but absorbed uh, during his lifetime into Metro Boston uh, with urbanization and industrial revolution. Um, the railroad came through to connect it. Uh, Thoreau's family was a part of this. Uh, it's a uh, home industry of pencil making and later graphite processing for uh, mass produced uh, printing industry. Um, so we have to think of Thoreau as, as uh, inhabiting that as well as writing against it at times, the um, massification of American culture that happened uh, at that moment. Uh, he, lived there, he lived there almost his whole life under the same roof as his family. Uh, after college, he became swept up by uh, the so-called transcendentalist movement whose epicenter was Concord. Key spokesperson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, whose key doctrine, and you could say this of Thoreau too, um, was the infinitude of the private man. That's Emerson's summation. It could have been Thoreau's. Um, a human potential movement, you could say, in today's lingo, uh, the first movement on behalf of youth in the history of American culture. Um, it was a cliche then to think of the US as a young country, but um, the first youth movement, that's this. Uh, he rejected a conventional career to become a freelance writer of iconoclastic essays and irreverent narratives of foraging around the region. Died early of the family curse of TB, uh, the curse of many families in those days, with most of his work unfinished and uh, in obscurity, typed as an Emerson clone, an Emerson disciple. Um, Emerson's friend, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, the Harvard doctor, also an author, um, quipped that Thoreau nibbled his asparagus at the wrong end. He was kind of unwarrantedly perverse. Uh, but by the mid 20th century, 100 years later, um, all had changed. Uh, the village crank became a world figure uh, that's from Edward Abbey, nature writer and uh, a Thoreau uh, disciple in his own right, a cranky Thoreau disciple. Um, and witness of this would be uh, the history of the Thoreau Society from its inception in 1941 till now versus the Emerson Society. The Thoreau Society has become huge and worldwide. Um, it's uh, annual gatherings almost a week long. Uh, and it's uh, membership, uh, not just uh, scholars like me, but real people. Um, <laughs> and the Everson Society is on life support perpetually, uh, underfunded um, with uh, the professors talking to each other. Uh, sorry, um, all you Emerson fans. I'm an Emerson fan too. Um, so how did this happen? Um, well, uh, first, I'll say the what, and then uh, some brush strokes about the why. Um, Thoreau now has multiple claims to fame, multiple ways, um, trajectories of his achievement, and ways in which he's remembered. And um, not all Thoreauvians are interested in the same version of Henry David. Um, He's the icon of uh, voluntary simplicity lifestyle, um, back to basics. Um, he's the iconic civil disobedient, um, a term that he probably coined. We think he did. On the strength of the two works that um, made his fame secure and are still by far the most read today, Walden, and civil disobedience. Um, I've put in the chat for the virtual audience links to this first edition of Walden, um, the little house 
in the pines, uh, the wrong kind of trees. I'm told by an ecologist friend of mine, but so what? Um, <laughs> sketched by uh, his sister, Sophia, who is um, uh, a confidant uh, at a company, a person who accompanied him on some of his field trips and his first literary executor. Um, and Civil Disobedience, uh, first published in a collection of transcendental writings edited by uh, Elizabeth Peabody, um, of whom uh, Megan Marshall has written uh, a terrific uh, biography or a biography of the Peabody sisters, of whom she's one. Um, we'll rest it on the air for the moment. Um, in addition, uh, Thoreau, uh, partly on the basis of those works, Thoreau is remembered as a pioneer ecologist, a patron saint of modern environmentalism, a father of modern nature writing, an iconic spiritual seeker uh, thought by some, held up by some as a kind of prophet or yoga, yogi or sage. Um, one of the first of whom it might be said that he was spiritual, not religious, which is a persuasion that uh, many, many folk today would own. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, which actually drew me to him at the very first, uh, a catalyst of national literary emergence, that era of Emerson, Whitman, Melville, Dickinson, Hawthorne, when um, uh, the uh, literary firepower of this country first began to uh, attract attention uh, abroad as well as at home. Um, so. The upshot here, um, at first, we see the uh, mark of obscurity, Henry's modest little marker in Concord Sleepy Hollow Cemetery uh, with a few uh, votive stones and uh, flowers and veggies left by the hands of today. And now, um, the more monumentalized Thoreau, uh, the site of uh, the Walden House uh, with a view of Walden Pond. Um, and there's a sign that you can't read uh, just in front of that pile of stones, uh, votive stones that are left by pilgrims and uh, they keep uh, increasing day by day. My interruptions. What that sign says is, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and to see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when, he came, when I came to die uh, to discover that I had not lived. Often quoted words and uh, the takeoff of a section of Walden uh, that uh, Megan and I will return to uh, in the dialogue. So how did he accomplish all this? Um, in a nutshell, uh, I'd say these four things up front and more will come out uh, as the hour unfolds. Uh, the power of the pen is crucial. Uh, Laura Walsh in her biography uh, speaking about um, Thoreau's relationship to John Brown, the uh, Harper's Ferry gorilla, uh, whom Thoreau eloquently defended in several um, orations, wrote, John Brown's sword was impressive, but without the word, it was just a sword. Well said. The power of memorable utterance. Then the power to dramatize embodied action from principle. Here we um, might contrast uh, the Emerson persona in his essays with the Thoreau persona, the guru and the sometime disciple. Uh, Emerson <coughs> unfolds quite eloquently at its level a theory of nature's inspirational value that uh, Thoreau reads very seriously and runs with but it's Thoreau that uh, portrays how to live it out. 
um, in an embodied way in Walden. Uh, so hence the cliche, uh, Emerson theorized, uh, Thoreau put it into practice. Um, that's a little extreme, but it's not too much with the uh, difference that you feel when you read the two. Um, the power to dramatize personal experience further as potentially exemplary and shareable, uh, that's no less crucial. Uh, Walden isn't just a personal memoir. Um, it's a memoir uh, that opens up into a you can do it too. Um, and finally, the power to dramatize uh, the great differences that small steps can take. Um, you don't have to go far from home uh, to do that Walden experiment or to make uh, a political statement uh, in your flesh that has traction and consequences. So finally, just quickly to speak about some knotty issues that this book tries to tackle. Um, and what I'm going to tick off does by no means exhaust the list of things that it addresses. But uh, these are some um, that I struggle with, uh, I felt pretty good about the resolution of, um, and uh, drew me to do this project in the first place. One is the remarkableness of the disciple eclipsing the master after having lived in such proximity his whole life. Um, that never ceases to be a source of wonderment to me. Uh, I can think of very few, if any, uh, parallels in world history, uh, except maybe Plato and Aristotle. Uh, going back that far. Maybe you can. I, if you can, tell us. Tell me. Um, so I meditate about this uh, in my book on Emerson 20 years ago and uh, felt I had come to part of the solution. And here um, I take this up again. How to square the political Thoreau with the back to nature Thoreau. That's another biggie. Um, the confrontational Thoreau and the Thoreau who disengages and retreats. Um, how to square the poetic side of Thoreau with the scientific side. Thoreau was a, a person who was acutely qualitative and quantitatively very competent and committed as well. Um, these two sides of him, right brain, left brain, fought with each other, but they also came together in a kind of synergy. And um, in, in a couple of my chapters, I could go back to the table of contents, uh, I address that. First on the writer, then on the turn to science. One looks forward to the next, the next looks back at the former. And finally, uh, and we'll get into this more um, when the dialogue starts, as it will in an instant, uh, the challenge of being faithful to Thoreau's pungent but tricky prose. Um, Thoreau writes in a fashion that's both striking uh, and easy to miss the full um, meat or delivery of the levels of nuance. As I you know, try to sum it up at one point, uh, the prose oscillates between forthright and elusive confidential and standoffish, lyric and sarcastic, polemical and ruminative, documentary and impassioned, serious and sly. And I probably have left some adjectives out, but if this, that sentence were any longer, uh, people would fall asleep. Uh, I wanted to make it striking. Um, and, you know, you can only do so many X and Y uh, before you know, the reader tunes out. Uh, so, um, with that, I think I'll pause and miraculously I kept it to 20 minutes and um, have me sit down and make it come to the stage too and we'll move to the dialogue part. Okay.
Thank you, Larry. And also thanks to the AAS for having us both here. Um, welcome the Zoom audience and in-person audience. So Larry, um, some critics of Thoreau complain that his Walden experiment wasn't pure. He didn't truly isolate himself, and he relied on his family for dinners and laundry. I know there are lots of ways to refute those charges. But what I wonder is whether Thoreau's life away from Walden may have been the truly radical experiment, of which the Walden excursion was just an episode. He had a college degree, as you say, but he didn't take up a profession. He didn't marry. He didn't really leave home. So thinking disobediently is your subtitle, but maybe living disobediently is what he did. Uh, was the whole life the experiment? I think that's very fair, and it um, syncs with what many uh, deep dyed in the wool Thoreauvians say about his journal, uh, the uh, record of his life and um, foragings that he kept his whole adult life, that it, and not any of his published works, uh, is uh, the great work of Thoreau. Uh, in part because it comes closest to exactly what you say, uh, the record of the life. Um, Thoreau did also say, though, about writing versus life, uh, this is a kind of doggerel poem that he um, wrote in his mid-twenties. My life would be the poem I would have writ, but I could not both live and utter it. My life would be the poem I would have writ, but I could not both live and, uh, and utter it. Um, there's a little playing possum there, I think, Megan. I mean, he really has aspirations, high aspirations as a writer. But um, whatever he writes, um, and this is the significance, I think, of the journal, too, uh, which is a seedbed of his writing, uh, whatever he writes is going to come out of the life. So the life comes first, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, how many, uh, why would someone sit down to write when he hasn't stood up to live? I've almost got correct one of his one-liners, his zingers in Walden, so. Okay, great, great. So, and when you want to answer these critics who say, you know, he didn't really do what he said he was doing, how do you answer that? Yeah, I often get this kind of critique from um, the pond students. scum uh, New Yorker right. piece. Right. Yeah, well, there's that. But just thinking about um, the tendency in Walden to exaggerate the distance, the remoteness, the wildness of his locus next to the pond. Um, within plain view of the public road, uh, as one disgruntled townsman said. <laughs> Concord was at an all-time low in forest cover at that time, so you could, you could see a much further way, and he had less privacy than, um, than that has right now, even with the hordes of tourists and pilgrims. Um, so I think the point was um, uh, two things. The point was to... Um, demonstrate how far he could distance himself mentally um, by just a small removal. Mm -hmm. And if you've been living in essentially a boarding house situation, which his family was, uh, surrounded by people um, going out um, to the verge of the town in a semi-woodsy location and uh, having a one-person tiny house. That's a big change. Uh, plus which, here's another take on the subject. Um, it was weird. Um, it propelled him uh, into a fringe situation, or I should say even more of a fringe situation uh, than he was in to begin with, uh, having not entered a standard profession the way that uh, minister, doctor, whatever that Harvard graduates were supposed to do. So he was already being ragged on for that. And to do this was strange. The uh, uh, institution of, of summer camping or the uh, 
getaway retreat up in the outer Andes. This was not yet. This is still a generation off. Right. So um, you uh, have been working on Thoreau all your academic career. Did you take an interest in him before that as a young lad yourself? Did you buy, uh, build your own cabin? As a young lad, no, no. I, <laughs> I'm a klutz with building things. So it's a lot uh, more compatible for me to read about building than it is to actually to do it. Um, so uh, I'm more the, the poet side, the wordsmith side, uh, than the hands-on side. I do do some things hands-on, but OK. So as a lad, I was a country boy that attracted me. Uh, I was somewhat bulky about authority, and I first read Thoreau uh, at a susceptible time. Um, he was somebody that pushed back on um, orthodoxies of all kinds. And you know, one of the one-liners, another of them in Walden is, I've lived on this planet for almost 30 years, and I have yet to hear the least syllable of good advice from my seniors. And I'm thinking, hurrah, yeah, that's <laughs> Later, I start teaching him, and I you know, get into my 40s, my 50s, my 60s. Whoa. Well, uh, still, it's salutary. I, I take that to heart, that, uh, that um, youth perspective. So there was that. Then there was still one other thing that I'll mention, which is, I had a father who basically hated his day job, but he was passionately committed to land use issues, to um, the uh, the work of planning in a context of a country threatened by suburban sprawl, toxification, Rachel Carson issues. So he would drag us kids around to these fractious planning board meetings, and that kind of um, sensitized me to environmental issues early on. Then, oh yeah, finally, finally, sorry, I'm going on too long. Uh, I always had a partiality for um, what you might call um, intellectual prose, nonfiction prose, that which sits on the borderline of literature, philosophy, religion, social thought. <coughs> so I was a sucker for transcendentalism, uh, which did that and the other things I've mentioned. Uh, as well as uh, some other writers that I want. And so the writing that you do is also a bit in that vein, trying to draw from the text to um, uh, reach all those fields. I think that's one of the great things about this book, I'll just say. It does touch on philosophy, religion, uh, science. Well, you may be crediting me with an omnicompetence that I don't quite deserve, <laughs> but I love it. OK. <laughs> so. Um, in the book, you use the term descriptive memoir to describe Thoreau's works like Walden and A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. I, don't, I hadn't really thought of those works as memoirs because they aren't all that personally revealing. And I was surprised when I was doing my own research on the period to find that in his first lectures at the Concord Lyceum on his Walden experience, Thoreau called, the, his title was History of Himself. They, it sounds very much like, you know, auto fiction or something. Anyway, memoir. So I was wondering, do you think he was actually revealing something personal in these books, any kind of hidden confession? And what would he have thought of the kind of memoirs we're used to today, where, you know, you tell all, you really confess? He would have had some issues with the tell-all confession mode of writing, that's for sure. Um, I'll, I'll answer first obliquely um, mm -hmm. and then try to be more candid or more um, upfront with your question. Um, I think that uh, he would want to claim that um, as he says at the beginning of Walden, um, what I'm looking for, uh, they, uh, well, we commonly don't um, perceive that it is always the first person who is speaking. So he would want to argue that at a certain level, um, everything that he sets down in that book 
is a testament. Um, maybe memoir is not the term that you would want to put on it, but it's the wisdom of experience or the takeaway of experience um, with details uh, retrieved from uh, memory and um, his journals, uh, even if it's not uh, centrally developed as the saga of how a formerly desperate young man found new life through nature. Um, so I think he would want to argue that. Um, but uh, acknowledging the disparity that you're talking about between what this is and that is the Walden that we have and what um, memoir connotes today. Um, I think that uh, he's um, holding back from the latter in part because uh, he's, um, he's a reserved person and he doesn't tend to um, disclose a great deal about his intimate life even in his journal, his, mm -hmm. his uh, secret strivings and uh, despairs, and um, he d which he did have some, we know it. Um, just well, maybe we see, you know, his coping with the loss of his brother and other, you know, uh, in situating himself in this place where he can go on to a new life. Yes, yes. His first book, A Week in the Concord of Merrimack Rivers, is dedicated to his brother. Uh, and there's a nugget of personal narrative or, or brotherly narrative that goes all the way through the book. The canoe trip, or the, uh, the trip by um, sail and uh, foot to Mount Washington's Peak uh, that uh, the two of them took together. But there's very little in the way of uh, fraternal portrayal, much less the feelings. Mm -hmm. But instead, embedded in the very center of that book is a long disquisition on friendship that clearly has a bearing on the relationship between Thoreau and Emerson and also the relation between Thoreau and his, his brother. But it's so oblique. It's, it, you can say that that's a fault, uh, but it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there's a self-published book floating around on the internet that calls itself a translation of Walden, modernized for the 21st century. It claims to reword the outdated formal language of the original text and to use a simple conversational style, removing references to Greek and Roman mythology and adding chapter subheadings for easy subject reference points. This translator of Walden explains his alterations by saying, Walden is a book too important not to read. Maybe you can give us your sense of what Thoreau is doing with language and why Walden is too important not to read in the original. I know uh, we have a yes. passage to discuss, which I'm going to put up on the slideshow here. We can figure out how to do it. Here we go. I don't want completely to diss this translation. <laughs> at translation. Um, the author worked hard at it. I've, I haven't read it all the way through from start to finish. But um, as a paraphrase into plain language, I think it's not bad. Um, but when you paraphrase um, Thoreau into plain language, some stuff gets lost. So this is a passage uh, from uh, the second chapter of Walden, Where I Lived and What I Lived For. That's the kind of, a kind of credo chapter uh, which pairs off with the first long one uh, called Economy, where he makes his argument about simplifying the terms of existence and spells out uh, how he himself simplified. So I'll read it out, and then we can talk about it a little bit. Every morning was a cheerful invitation to make my life of equal simplicity. 
and I may say innocence, with nature itself. I have been as sincere a worshiper of Aurora as the Greeks. I got up early and bathed in the pond. That was a religious exercise and one of the best things I ever did. They say that characters were engraven on the bathing tub of King Qingpang to this effect, renew thyself completely each day. Do it again and again and forever again. I can understand that. Morning brings back the heroic ages. I was as much affected by the faint hum of a mosquito making its invisible and unimaginable tour through my apartment at earliest dawn when I was sitting with door and windows open as I could be by any trumpet that ever sang of fame. It was Homer's requiem, itself an Iliad and Odyssey in the air, singing its own wrath and wandering. Well, okay, the mashup here of uh, the exalted and the mock heroic, uh, the noxious insect attacking the cabin dweller uh, being blown up into this Iliad and Odyssey um, and singing its own wrath and wanderings, um, the uh, serious but also slightly playful invocation of uh, the uh, Confucian um, books that King Ching Chong uh, is uh, in uh, the first of the four Confucian books, The Great Learning. You can go rush out and read it. Um, the uh, layering of that uh, gets lost in um, the translation. If you, were to leave, if you were to leave out Iliad, Odyssey, the king, Aurora, uh, how much would you still have of this passage? I, I took a bath every morning in Walden Pond. That would be nice, I guess, and I felt refreshed. But um, yeah, it's not the same. I, I think that uh, this is a glimpse of how uh, the self-presentation and the book as a whole unfolds. There are great aspirations and very serious aspirations that uh, Thoreau uh, wants to present uh, the um, experiencer himself uh, at the time of the Walden experiment uh, to have had. Um, and to exhort the reader to take it seriously. But he also knows that he's only a person and um, he wants license to be whimsical uh, and to uh, be playful, satiric, um, to veer off course, uh, not to write some kind of tract. Mm -hmm. and well, it's, it was the inevitable. era of, of uh, an era of self-help writing. You it could was. have said, "Take a bath every day," and published that in the, you know, p publication of health and one of these magazines that there's so many of here. Um, yeah. So it's well, interesting to uh, can I just make a yeah. comparison? A contemporary work that has sometimes been compared to Thoreau is uh, by uh, a very um, very able a woman who was kind of at the fringes of the transcendentalist movement, Lydia Maria Child, the frugal housewife. And it's a do-it-yourself thing uh, about uh, how, to, how to live on a level mm -hmm. uh, frugally. But it's dead serious from start to finish. Uh, it would not need this kind of paraphrase, except maybe for a few words here and there. You could reprint it. Uh, and nobody would um, say that it's highfalutin at right, any point. Right. So, yeah. Well, I think we should have some questions from the audience here and virtually, and maybe so, we're in the classroom. You could okay. give your comments on the text if you want. But. So I have a mic here. I'll bring it over to you if you'd like to ask a question. I see a hand over here. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, two questions. Um, I think of his uh, legacy, which is so impressive, going from uh, Tolstoy to Gandhi to Martin Luther King. And I wonder who he would designate uh, as his intellectual antecedents. Uh, first question. Second question, I'm curious about who he would uh, uh, also identify as his best friends, his uh, support structures. Um, you mentioned he never married. Did he have any romantic relationships? Okay, both excellent questions. Um, they're addressed in the book. Um, to the first, Thoreau um, had a quasi precedent um, in his civil disobedience in the form of his elder transcendentalist friend, Bronson Alcott, um, who um, committed an act of tax resistance rather like Thoreau's own. Um, not long before he did, well, a few years before he did. Um, and uh, that's a partial answer to the second question, did he have any intimates? They were uh, very different in age, but they formed a kind of intimacy, intimacy of fringy types in the town of Concord that uh, was important to Thoreau. Uh, be, be, behind Alcott was um, an interesting uh, pretty much lost uh, today um, movement of uh, pacifism that started with the War of 1812 and um, some New Englanders' um, aversion to being drawn into it. Um, uh, this New England non-resistance movement, as it was called, uh, endured um, uh, into the 1840s and a little bit beyond uh, until the tide of uh, progressive northern uh, opposition to uh, rising influence of slave interests began to uh, just erode the pacifist project. William Lloyd Garrison, the great abolitionist, uh, was a non-resister, um, uh, famous for burning the Constitution at anti-slavery meetings. So this is something of the context that you're asking about. Um, on uh, intimacies, uh, Thoreau is known to have briefly courted one woman that his brother at the same time was also courting. Uh, and uh, I think of it as a case of, uh, in part, at least, mimetic desire. Uh, you, you, you desire X uh, in part because X is being desired by somebody else. And it's a triangle. But yes, there's that. Um, and uh, she turned them both down. She turned them both down. Um, <laughs> one of the, I mean, the standard story is her father made her say no, but I'm not sure she ever would have said yes. Um, would you have said yes to marrying Thoreau? Um, <laughs> oh, ye women in the audience, uh, I'm not sure. And I often would ask my students, too, um, if you had to choose a roommate, um, which would it be, Emerson or Thoreau? And that makes them think. You know, they like Thoreau basically uh, as a literary persona better than they like Emerson, this sort of abstract recording consciousness. But then they think, hmm, he might be a little hard. Um, where the uh, Thoreau had his greatest intimacy was within the family circle. It was a very close-knit family. And we don't have a whole lot of a print record to show for that because uh, they were so much together. Uh, but it's very clear that he was very close with all his three siblings, um, not just his brother, but his two sisters. I mentioned Sophia, the one that wrote the sketch, uh, who did the sketch of the cabin. Um, and that was sustaining. Um, but uh, yeah, few friendships. Some but few. Uh, so he wasn't a hermit. Um, and I take him more or less seriously when he says in Malden, I am naturally no hermit, although he goes on to call himself one. Uh, but he was not warm fuzzy either. Uh, and as Emerson said, there was something military in his disposition. 
Um, his instinct, whenever he heard a proposition, was to controvert it, which, says Emerson, adds Emerson, is a little chilling to the social affections. <laughs> but there were friends he tramped through the woods with. He was quite often with friends. Yes, he was. Um, he had easier relations uh, at the adult level with um, smart older women than he did with men, with um, farmers and other uh, rustic types who didn't put on airs, and with children. He was great with children. Um, the Emerson kids um, looked at him as a kind of surrogate father. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, you're wise to. So we'll go we, to some more questions. Yep. We have a question from our YouTube audience, Nan. Yes, we do. We actually have a, a comment and a question. So the comment from Steve McGuire is uh, that I think uh, everything that Thoreau wrote was autobiographical, either directly or in his choice of subjects. Um, and then related to that, Todd uh, Jim's comments or asks, I wonder if you could compare Thoreau's autobiographical works with those of Frederick Douglass, particularly Walden and My Bondage and My Freedom. Well, um, to the first, yes, amen. Uh, if you take an elastic uh, definition of autobiography, and I think it can be elasticized. Um, or to put it another way, um, all that Thoreau wrote um, has more or less some autobiographical basis to it, almost all. I mean, there's some book reviews that he wrote that don't, for the most part. And in later life, um, in his uh, natural history writings, um, scientific writings uh, that have been um, published only in recent years, the last 25 or 30, um, the, the I is pretty absent, and it's the emphasis on the findings that counts. In his later years, uh, he becomes more, so to speak, extrospective, that is, fixed more uh, on the world around him than on uh, the inner world uh, that is uh, uh, himself. Um, but then, um, also to speak to uh, the comparison with Frederick Douglass. Hmm. Uh, Douglass's three autobiographies, of which uh, the one named by the questioner is the second, uh, themselves uh, morph. Uh, the first is uh, closest to a kind of uh, template others practice, the slave narrative. Uh, and the second, and especially the third, uh, are um, more um, autobiographical documentaries of um, the life of Douglas the person. Um, I'd be tempted to say that um, the first, uh, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, which still is the most read of the three. Uh, it's the easiest to assign in the class, for one thing, um, because it's so short, pungent. Um, that uh, precisely because the uh, speaker is a more or less exemplary figure, um, he's speaking for the miseries that slaves experience um, is maybe uh, closer to the Walden model than um, the next to the other two, the two subsequent autobiographies, which uh, are much, uh, much more um, focused on uh, personal uh, episodes and events. And there's it's also the, the natural world plays a strong role in the narrative. 
and the, the, the scene when he uh, uh, goes out into the woods and finds this root that gives him power. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is a comparison that is, it's, it's great that the questioner brought this up. Um, that's, you know, people have compared those books. One thing that, one thing that my bondage and my freedom uh, does that uh, the narrative of Frederick Douglass doesn't quite do is it brings out uh, Douglass's sensitivity to nature, his love of nature. Uh, the, uh, um, the, the incident of the root, which is really pivotal to uh, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, yeah, uh, that's more instrumental, so to speak, in uh, trying to, in, in helping him feel confident mm -hmm. about being able to defeat the uh, slave driver that he bests in combat afterwards. Uh, but the, a sense of the love of the natural world really does come out in the second book. And maybe that's the okay. question we meant. Maybe. Do you yeah. have more yeah. questions from uh, the we'll, we'll do a question here from the audience in the room. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, so I had two questions. Actually, one, one thought that came to mind. I, I wondered if he... Um, when I'm thinking about this return to nature and um, the significance of childhood and youth, um, I wonder about Rousseau and his writings and wonder if, if he was at, at, um, at all inspired by Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his writings about going back to nature and innocence and childhood and purity and, and, and things like that. Um, so that's just one thought that I wanted to share. And then the second was, if you could comment a little bit, I'm sure it's in your book, but um, if you could comment a little bit about his, the interface of uh, his scientific mind, the science and maybe his spirituality, faith, if you can call it faith, um, and, and how he was able to, if you can discuss a little bit about sort of his, his inner discourse on that, how he appropriated those two uh, seemingly discordant sort of understandings of the world and um, if he at all meant to you know publicize his thought his thoughts on the interface of science and spirituality especially in the climate that he was living in sure um, the answer to the first is distressingly simple um, Rousseau was not part of his pantheon um, the antecedents there um, would be the British Romantics, particularly Wordsworth. Uh, that did for him what you might well suppose uh, Rousseau uh, would have done. Um, on the second, um, the sense of tension between um, the right brain, left brain that I mentioned before uh, didn't um, extends so much as you might suppose to uh, this uh, question of uh, science versus faith. But there is a famous uh, passage uh, in uh, his journal um, of his reaction to a questionnaire that was sent to him by the American Academy for the Advancement of Science in which he says, I can't answer this question, um, questionnaire uh, really uh, according uh, and speak to what really matters to me about uh, the natural world. Uh, so uh, he says, I only answered the part that uh, uh, these donkeys could understand. Uh, the fact is, I am a mystic, a transcendentalist, and a natural philosopher to boot. I come to think of it, I should have just said I was a transcendentalist, and that would have been the shortest way of telling them that they could not understand me. Um, well, uh, in fact, the way that he did look at the natural world um, presupposed uh, or rested on a notion of its coherence that is somewhat, uh, we would say today, old-fashioned, that the um, the moral coherence of the universe was not something that Thoreau finally questioned. Um, and um, 
he either put it aside or he kind of silently fitted in to um, his writings about his granular and uh, empirically rigorous writings about uh, forest succession, for example. The uh, topic of plant succession is where I think he made his greatest contributions as, as a practicing scientist. Uh, so he did not experience the kind of um, schism between the spheres of religion and science that uh, others, particularly in the later 19th century, did. Or science might express religion. Or it might, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, we have one more question from our YouTube audience. Yes, uh, Lucy Salabit's asking, how do you reconcile the thorough of the political essays with the nature writing thorough? Yeah, uh, I think these two things could be said. I mentioned Thoreau's um, characteristic stance of opposition, as Emerson describes it. So there's always um, at least a kind of residual um, political um, position inherent there uh, for Thoreau. It comes out uh, in episodic spurts. Uh, that, that's true at the level of his writing. There are half a dozen um, major political essays. And it comes out in, in um, the track record of his activism, which is uh, not trivial, uh, but uh, he's not um, engaging in uh, activist work every day of the week. Um, I think the um, deepest uh, reconciliation uh, between uh, the back to nature thorough and the political thorough uh, is this, that um, disengagement is key to his, um, the, the freedom that he is able to take in um, assailing orthodoxies of all kinds, uh, including business as usual, a government and uh, the abuses that he sees as going with that. Um, the um, inner freedom and also the uh, disengagement from material entanglements uh, confer uh, the ability to be both the diagnostician and to stand to stand free of. of um, the, uh, uh, about as free as a human being could get of the societal oppressions that he decries. So that would be my answer in a nutshell. Well, you have to you. read the book to get the whole story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you do. You have to read the book. And I will say to the folks who are here in our audience tonight, uh, our friends from Tide Pool Books Bookshop, have copies of the book here, which which you can purchase afterward. I would love to uh, thank Larry Buell and Megan Marshall for this conversation this evening about the new book, Henry David Thoreau, Thinking Disobediently. I would like to thank all of you who are here tonight, as well as watching on YouTube. Again, this is being recorded, and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to recommend it to your friends, please do. Uh, we have several programs coming up in the next few weeks that I want to mention. Next Thursday night, Nell Irvin Painter will deliver our Robert C. Barron lecture. It's called Sojourner Truth Was a New Yorker, and she didn't say that. That's at 7 p.m. next Thursday night, uh, both in person and on YouTube. The following Thursday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we have a history of the book talk with Caroline Wigginton about her recent book, Indigenuity. Native Craft Work and the Art of American Literatures. There are also several programs in November. You can check those out on our website, which is AmericanAntiquarian.org. You can also watch any of our previous programs on the YouTube channel. For now, thank you so much and have a good evening.